everyone. Um, wow, I'm excited to be here. Um, and I'm really, really excited that we get to start this day off and the conference actually talking about peer-to-peer -peer protocols because it's something I think is super fascinating. And I have some interesting stuff to show off um, later in my talk. Um, this talk is called Reclaiming the Web with Peer-to-Peer -peer Protocols. Uh, but before I dive in and tell you what in the world that's all about, I want to introduce myself. Hi, I'm Tara Vansel, and I'm a web developer. Um, I'm also really, really into anything to do with nails and nail art, and I love music, especially if it's from Beyonce. So if you like nails or Beyonce or both, we should definitely talk later on. Um, I'm a web developer, but I've spent about the last year and a half in a kind of a strange role. Um, because instead of working on a team where my job is to build websites, I've actually been building a browser with these two guys, P. Frazee and Mafintosh. And we've been building a browser because we had some weird experiments that we wanted to run, and we figured that the browser was the best place to do that. And the browser we're building is called Beaker, and it's an experimental browser, which means that we're doing experiments in the, like, the science way. It doesn't mean that it's like buggy or you know, just like a really basic prototype. It actually works. You can download it. Um, and the core experiment we're running in Beaker is what happens when you put a peer-to-peer -peer protocol into the browser. Some pretty interesting things happen, it turns out, um, like being able to publish a website from the browser and being able to offer um, experimental peer-to-peer -peer APIs to developers. Um, I'm going to tell you a lot more about Beaker, and in fact, I'm going to show you Beaker later. And before I do that, I want to spend some time to uh, reflect on what even is the web, because I think it's relevant to our conversation. Um, so if I'm, I'm asking us to reclaim the web, I think we should probably talk about who, who took it in the first place and what have they done with the web, right? Like, I mean, we're, we're all here in this room at a conference dedicated to the web. So surely the web can't be in too much trouble, right? I actually have to agree. I'm, I'm extremely optimistic about the future of the web, and I'm really pleased with where the web is at right now. Um, I'm really happy to see so many new people still coming, uh, coming to the web every day to learn how to build things with HTML and JavaScript and CSS. And I'm pleased to see that the tools that we depend on, like NPM and web, uh, Webpack and Babel, are steadily improving to make our workflows seamless and our lives easier. And I'm thrilled to see that browsers are working really hard to uh, improve the feature set of the web and improve compatibility across browsers. And if you're not optimistic about the web for some reason, I might highlight that earlier this week, the Chrome Developer um, Summit happened. And this was an opportunity for the Chrome developers and the Chrome team to share their ideas and their prototypes about how the web is going to move forward. Um, they announced some really cool proposals like virtual scrolling, which should hopefully improve loading um, as you scroll down a page. Um, and some other neat stuff was dump mode, like uh, Houdini, which is an improvement on how CSS works. And seeing all these really neat announcements uh, earlier this week, it gave me some time to reflect on some of the wins that the web has had recently, like CSS Grid, which, if I dare say, makes composing layouts like actually kind of fun. Um, or, or the fact that Boku has been working really hard with the W3C and other browser vendors to build a huge test suite for compatibility across the web. The web is making progress, and I think it's really important to recognize that, and especially to recognize the people that make it happen, because their jobs are not easy. Um, and also because the web is a miracle of human cooperation, when you think about it. When you take a second to think about what the web e even is, it's a miracle that it exists, and let alone that it's improving. Um, the web is this strange thing where seven billion people on Earth have somehow come together and decided on a language for how we build digital stuff and get it from one computer to another. Like, that is absolutely, mir absolutely miraculous that we pulled that off. And the end result is, it doesn't look that exciting, but it's actually really cool, right? You have a web page, and no matter what context you're browsing it in, with, there's some, uh, you have a reasonable expectation that it will work consistently. And uh, if you'll allow me a moment to be sentimental, I just want to say that I think that's badass. This is a 
talk about reclaiming the web, though. So even though I am really optimistic about the web, I'm a little bit worried, too. I'm worried because the web is imperfect, and honestly, that's okay, especially when you think about how the web is this weird, amorphous set of technologies that um, we have all just agreed to use, but that's pretty much the only thing that binds it together, is our shared agreement to use it. And on top of that, the web is only 28 years old. Uh, the first web browser was built in 1990 by Tim Berners-Lee. It's called WorldWideWeb.app. And it was only 25 years ago that the first mainstream browser was released. That was called Mosaic. So we're talking, like, we're operating on a really small time scale here. The web is a baby, so you can expect it to have some problems. Um, the web is imperfect, we can accept that, but I think the next step is to then ask ourselves, how are we going to shape the next 30 years? And by we, I mean actually we, us, the people in this room who are web developers, people who maybe influence standards. Um, we do have some say over how the web works. <clears throat> we know that the web is gonna change, right? Because there are standards bodies and browser vendors and other interested parties who want to shape the web. But the question is, uh, what values are we going to choose to uphold in the next 30 years? What new features are we going to enable? How do we decide those things? Um, I think oftentimes those things are decided by our personal experiences. Maybe someone in this room is a WebGL developer, so you might care a lot about how graphics rendering will change on the web in the next 30 years. Some of you probably work with e-commerce, and so you might be paying more attention to the Web Payments API. Or maybe some of you in this room have been the target of a focused harassment campaign on social media. And so you might have an interest in seeing how the web learns from what we've seen about how humans engage online in the last 28 years. Um, the web is very, very new and we're still learning so much about how communities work online and how humans behave. And when I think about what I want the web to look like in 30 years, Honestly, the community bit of it is what interests me most. Um, yeah, the, like the graphics and all the cool technical stuff about the web is amazing. It's what makes the web the web. But we come to the web because we want to talk to people, right? We want to share our interests. We want to make friendships and form communities. So I'm extremely interested to ask, how can, we, how can the web platform itself change, however subtly, the ways that we interact with each other online? Um, whether you like it or not, right now, this guy has a lot of say over how online communities work. Um, and I'm not sure he knew what he was getting into when he started Facebook, but the point is that Facebook is a massive global online community, and we've learned some kind of terrifying things about humans interact with each other online. We're mean, we're nasty, we, we're reactive. We're just not very good at talking to each other, are we? And this guy and Sheryl Sandberg and some other folks are in charge of moving, helping us move forward. Um, and I frankly don't think they've stepped up to that responsibility very well. So I want us as web developers and as a web community to think about what can we do to adjust how people talk to each other online? Is there, are there some knobs that we can turn in terms of the technical architecture of the web that can improve the situation? I don't know, but this question is what motivated, to me, motivated me to work on Beaker, and it's been the um, guiding star in, in my exploration and the experiments that we've been running in Beaker. So, to go back to the question I mentioned earlier, what happens when you put a peer-to-peer -peer protocol in the browser? Would that be the right knob to turn to maybe make it a little bit nicer to communicate with people online? I don't know, um, but I can show you some of the experiments that we've done and uh, share some of the things that we've learned in the process. Um, but before I do that, let's just take a look at HTTP, because this is the knob that we turn in Beaker, the protocol knob. This is the most basic uh, distillation of how HTTP works, right? It's a client-server model where uh, one, one person can upload data to a server, uh, a server that belongs to, let's say, Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, and a person who wants to retrieve that data gets it from that service. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with that architecture, um, but I would like to propose that 
HTTP and this kind of client server architecture is a big part of why we've gotten um, the way, a big, big part of why online communities, massive online communities, um, have turned out to be so problematic. In contrast, this is what a, a web based on a peer-to-peer -peer protocol looks like. Again, this is, a, this is a contrived example, but it's a network wherein one individual can connect directly to another individual. And um, in this case, we're looking at someone sending a message, but we can also think of websites being transmitted from computer to computer uh, and cutting out servers. So why don't I just show you Beaker? Because I think it's a lot more exciting to see this stuff in action. Okay. How is that? Okay, so this is Beaker. It's a browser. Uh, it's not terribly exciting to look at when you're just looking at the start page, um, but it works like you would expect a browser to work. You can browse HTTPS websites. So this is the Beaker website. Again, nothing remarkable here. But if you can see in the very top right corner, there's this little tab that says P2P version available. It's really tiny, but I promise it's there. And when I click that, what's gonna happen is it's going to take me to the peer-to-peer -peer version of this website. Boom, there it is. You probably didn't even see that. Um, the only thing that's different is the protocol. It says DAT, D-A-T, and that's just the protocol we use in Beaker. And again, this website doesn't look like anything special. It's just a bunch of files, CSS, HTML, images, links, everything. It works just the way you would expect a browser to work. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that by putting a PDP protocol in the browser, we enabled some things like being able to publish a website from the browser. So I'm gonna show that off. I'm gonna go to this top right menu and click Create New. And I'm gonna um, create a website using a basic template that Beaker provides. And what's gonna happen when I click this button is Beaker will literally create a new URL for me and populate the website with some um, basic templating files. So I'm gonna click it, it's gonna happen really fast, and boom. Uh, what we're looking at here is Beaker's view source tool. Uh, I'll show you more of it later, but for now, let me just set this title of the website. Okay, and then I'm gonna open it up, and here it is. It's just a website, it doesn't really do anything except let you change the background color. But what's really interesting about this is this is a website and I could share the URL with any of you. You could open it up in Beaker and you could download the website and all of its files directly from me. I didn't publish these files on a server anywhere. I did it all inside of the browser. So how do you edit websites? Well, if we jump back to our view source tool, we can actually look at all of the files that compose a website. So um, why don't we open up the index.html and let's actually edit it. I'm gonna change this to say, hello, Seattle. Hit the save button. And when I refresh, you'll see the change. Cool. Um, I wanna also show off this neat feature we have, which is live reloading. We went ahead and put that right into the browser just because it's so convenient. Um, but if, like, all of us in this room, or a lot of us are developers, and we probably have a preference about how we write code. We might like Sublime or VS Code, and you can totally do that with Beaker as well. Um, I just have to set a folder real quick. This is basically going to sync the files over to a directory on my computer. I'm gonna turn off preview mode. Okay, so I'm gonna open this up in Sublime. So I'm gonna open the index.html in Sublime, and we're gonna go back to this website. We've got live reloading on, and I'm gonna edit the h1 tag again to say hello from Sublime. And when I hit save, which I'm gonna do in three, two, one, you'll see the updates. Boom, there we go. So, um, this is neat, but I, I mentioned earlier that Beaker also has peer-to-peer -peer APIs, and this is really where it gets exciting, because static websites are cool, they make up a lot of the web, but they're not every part of the web. We still need applications where people can have profiles and data related to their profiles. And Beaker's APIs are the key to making that possible. So I'm going to open DevTools, and I'm gonna show you a little bit how this works. 
Okay, to start off, we need to get access to the files that uh, compose this website. So I'm gonna do that using Beaker's Dat Archive constructor, which basically just gives you some, um, oops, right, oh, goodness. Which basically just gives you um, access to the functions that um, help you connect to the peer-to-peer -peer network. Okay, so we have, we have a variable that um, we're gonna be able to work with here. Let's start off with just listing all the files that are in this website. Um, you might notice that this, this looks a lot like the Node uh, file system API, and that was on purpose. So let's do files.readdeer, and we're gonna read the top level directory, and then we're going to console.log, whoops, that's not right. Console.log the output. Okay, what we're seeing here is a listing of all the files that compose this website. Uh, there's only six of them right now. Okay, let's see if we can read an individual file, the content of a file. We'll do files.read file. Let's do the index.html. Okay. There, we're looking at the actual content of this page. So we can, we can do all sorts of things, like read files, um, read file listings, but we can also write to files. And this is, gets really interesting when you start thinking about storing data in websites. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to, um, I'm actually going to overwrite the HTML file for this website. So we'll say files.write file. And I'm going to replace it with a new H1 tag. Okay, and now when I refresh, we get a totally new index.html. Okay, again, this is sort of a contrived example, but I wanna, I wanna take it back to a real world example. I said I'm really interested in thinking about how online communities can be sh shaped by the technology that underpins them. So I wanna show you an application that we built called Fritter. Okay, so this is Fritter. And as you can probably guess by the name and also the appearance, it is inspired by Twitter. And that was on purpose. I really like Twitter. I like a lot of things about Twitter. I just like some things about Twitter. But I like that it gives me a nice feed that I can follow my friends on, and I like that the content is short, sweet, um, and enjoyable most of the time. So we said, what, how far can we get with building something like Twitter using peer-to-peer -peer protocols. We got pretty far, actually. It's, it's pretty cool. So this doesn't look like much, but I'm gonna break down the architecture a little bit so you can see how neat this is. Fritter works in two pieces. There is the application itself, which is what we're looking at. It's a JavaScript application that uses Beaker's APIs to consume a profile and um, fetch data from the peer-to-peer -peer network and render it into a nice feed. And when I write a post, um, Beaker uses the write file API to write a post to my profile. You know, it works like you would expect, but what does a profile actually look like? What is a profile? Well, it's not a row in a database that lives up in a server somewhere. It's just a website, and this is it. Um, it has some metadata, uh, my name, my bio, well, not my bio, it's my fake Beyonce profile. Um, so it has the information about the people I follow, and it contains my posts in JSON. Now, this is really, really interesting because we've separated the data from the application, which that's not news. We are, we're used to doing that sort of thing as developers. But what is different is that your profile on Fritter is just a website. It's not tied to Fritter if you wanted to customize your own version of Fritter, um, you could do that, and your application, or your profile would still work. You wouldn't need to give up your circle of friends or your content, you could just keep carry on, carrying on like normal. And I think this demonstrates a lot of potential for building meaningful applications with peer-to-peer -peer protocols. Um, you know, Fritter works, this is, my, this is my demo profile, but there are posts from my friends, my like two friends, and people talk to each other. Uh, I'm not gonna say that this is the ideal architecture for moving forward on the peer-to-peer -peer web or that it won't have its own kind of problems. Um, but 
it's a community kind of controlled, uh, it's a kind of community controlled social media. And that's really, really excited to me because if there's anything I've learned about um, being a woman online in the last year and a half is that sometimes you really do want to take control over who you talk to and who you don't talk to because <laughs> otherwise it gets a little bit noisy. Um, so that is a quick and dirty tour of Beaker. We're, we're experimenting. We're doing a lot of things that are strange and they most certainly do not adhere to web standards. But we're doing it because we think it's worthwhile to be a little bit messy and to just see what happens. Uh, we don't have the, you know, the kind of reputation um, like Apple or Mozilla or Google does to, uh, to influence standards bodies. We're just some random people that had an idea and we built it. So we hope that you'll find it interesting. And if you wanna try out Beaker and see what other people have built, I recommend checking out my website. I have the P2P subdomain on my website. Um, download Beaker, visit this URL, and I've got a huge collection of websites, zines, apps, games, and other things that people have built on the peer-to-peer -peer web. Thank you so much for um, coming to hear about Beaker and the peer-to-peer -peer web. If you have any questions, uh, please do talk to me later, and you can check out the slides on my website, taravancel.com slash slides. Thank you so much. <laughs>